Well, let me uh, be more pointed with you about it then. Uh, Professor Jones makes the, the appropriate point that uh, Congress authorizes. This is not a situation like, for instance, uh, in Korea where uh, President Truman acted completely without congressional authorization, underscoring again, I think, Charlie's point last night that this is not a red state, blue state, Democrat, Republican phenomenon. Um, uh, Congress did pass overwhelmingly the authorization for the use of military force. It is an extremely broadly written authorization. It has never been uh, withdrawn. Uh, uh, is it your position that that authorizes that which follows and that certainly everything, put this to, any, uh, to the whole panel, certainly everything that which has gone on in the detention and interrogation realm uh, it has been, has received the prior sanction of uh, the legislative branch through the authorization. So, what, so what's the question? The, que the question is, there's nothing to worry about. The president is not acting uh, uh, beyond the reach of that which Congress has authorized him to do, and uh, the president's doing everything fine because Congress, uh, uh, we have had uh, checks and balances, and co if the Congress wants to take away the authorization, it can. It knows how to do it. It did it in Vietnam. It can with withdraw the authorization. I think that that underscores the, the, the point that I'm making about the role of the law and, and, and the role of Congress. If we look at uh, what Congress has done, it, you, you brought up the MCA. If we look at uh, the uh, MCA and what it attempted to do, it attempts to uh, criminalize and give the, the uh, commissions uh, jurisdiction over people who have provided m uh, material support uh, to, terrorists, to terrorism. Okay. Well, what that really means is that now there is no law of war that, that uh, uh, says material port was criminalized. What we have been operating under, uh, we have been operating under parameters that allow for uh, uh, prosecution and attacks on people who were uh, participating in hostilities. Okay. Uh, what that means is that people who were already detained, okay, are now possibly guilty of laws that were not even on the books at the time that they committed the acts. So, th again, this is just an exercise in, uh, I would say, strategic legalism. And, I, and, and, and I, I think that this is an instance where the Congress now did not act initially, but in response to the judicial decision, they now are acting on the, on, in, in the later phase after the conduct has taken place. Ambassador, let me ask you, did you get the sense within the administration at this really critical period, and I, and I think it's pretty it was clear, clear to us, at least, that uh, the decision in Rasul, the decisions in Hamdi uh, in 2004 took the administration by surprise. Do you have a sense, or did they, within the administration, have the sense that the, the uh, rug was pulled out from under you, that you guys thought that you had the authorization that you needed and the support that you needed from Congress to do that which you were doing, uh, and then suddenly the ground shifted uh, and it was uh, unfair to the effort that you had made? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it was, uh, you know, unfair because, uh, I mean, a few things happened along the way. We were able to begin to read the tea leaves as to where, which way some of the decisions were going based on the, uh, on, on the arguments. But, but I, I think the administration did early on believe that it, this was fully within the authority of the, of the executive branch. And I think, again, par partially because of uh, the interpretation of the law, partially because we did fully brief brief Congress uh, and partially because uh, we went on and were doing what we were doing for for several years before people began to raise to raise questions so then once it it actually uh, did get into the courts uh, it opened up a whole line of complexities and issues that people uh, needed to examine more closely and probably could have or should have uh, earlier on the other hand it's true that the authorization doesn't say anything about detention, and it doesn't say anything about treatment of prisoners. Um, how we fix your time, by the way? All right. Let's just make this the last question, and let's open it up some. I want to get the audience. Um, doesn't say anything about treatment of prisoners. Doesn't say anything about detention. Uh, do you think that uh, the authorization by itself uh, could have been, and, that, and the president's declaration that the conventions don't apply except to the extent that we choose to do it, uh, provides adequate protection for uh, and replacement of the existing legal structure, the pre-existing legal structure that Professor Graham talked about last night? 
I'll start that one. Um, I have no doubt that um, whether there is or isn't an AUMF, the executive has the authority to do what countries are entitled to do under conventional and customary laws of war. And what that is, is to detain people as either prisoners of war or civilians in situations of state-to-state -state armed conflict, wars between country A and country B. The um, entire fabric of the international humanitarian law of international armed conflict is built around the uh, concepts of who can be targeted, who can be detained, and what their status is upon detention. Um, but when you get into a question of uh, armed conflict between a state and a non-state entity, uh, a rebel group or a transnational terrorist organization, then the presumption of the laws of war is that domestic law will govern the question of detention, the power to detain and the right to challenge detention. So the conclusion that I think is, is inevitable from that is that as long as the United States was at war against Afghanistan, then it had an obligation to classify detainees as either POWs under the Third Geneva Convention or civilians under the Fourth Geneva Convention, and it had a right to detain people under the rubric of, of those conventions. Um, once, say, the Taliban uh, control of Afghanistan ended and the international phase of the conflict ended, then the question of uh, legal frameworks for detention become more complicated. Is it U.S. law? Is it Afghani law? Um, there, questions concerning the application of the, of the AUMF and whether or not it uh, entitles uh, the, the U.S. to detain individuals are more pertinent. And I think the, the conclusion that, that should have been drawn is that um, if Congress is going to pass a resolution for conduct of armed conflict, then it needed to do a better job of attending to precisely those simple fundamental issues that are the incidents of armed conflict, that is targeting, that is detention, that is treatment, and that is trials. And Congress failed to do so. If Congress fails to do so, then I think it's completely appropriate for the courts to step in in those situations, as it did do so on the question of, um, for example, um, the, the power to detain. It said habeas corpus applied. Congress also stepped in with the Military Commission Act on questions of trials and, and other issues. But once again, it made some substantial mistakes.